Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. recognized symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Hey, it's Conrad Thompson and you're listening to Arn. And of course we couldn't do it without the hall of famer himself, the founder of the four horsemen, the inventor of the spine buster double a himself, the enforcer, Arn Anderson, Arn, how are you, man? I'm doing well. Um, real quick, if I could Conrad, uh, our friend Brandy, who we know who's had a battle with, uh, with the COVID is turning out to be having some long-term effects and oh. uh she's uh, not doing well uh she had to go see uh, a doctor this week so i just want like everyone if they wouldn't mind to take a moment say a prayer say a prayer for brandy and uh we just hope she gets well soon you know let's pray for some knowledge to go in some of these doctors hands and minds and let's get her well Absolutely. Everyone who listened last week to our very special, uh, live Q and a that we did over at ad free shows. The first time you had an interaction with Brandy, uh, fell in love with her just like you did. And, uh, we're all pulling for her. So thoughts and prayers for her and her family. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Yeah. I want to give a peek behind the curtain too. Um, I guess we should tell everybody the reality is you and I have a tendency sometimes to whenever possible because of travel and my schedule and your schedule, we want to get ahead and we got ahead and a lot has happened since then. Something really magical happened a few weeks ago on TNT. Tully Blanchard got the proper send off that he was probably due more than 30 years ago. Uh, and it happened with a tag match with FTR. They wore the old Crockett tag titles to the ring and he wore his old robe and had his old U S title around his waist and, uh, sort of, uh, carrying on with him was Mr. JJ Dillon. And I don't know that we'll see JJ on TV too many more times. I don't think he's looking for a full-time gig in wrestling. And I don't know how many more matches Tully Blanchard actually wants to wrestle, but my goodness, even if you you know, sort of divorce yourself from the conversation for a moment. What a cool moment that was as a wrestling fan to see on a Turner station, right? i tell you what, it warmed my heart. You know, it was awesome. I had so much invested in that match with, you know, the new team who have become, you know, the benchmark for tag teams. Yep. You know, FTR out there with Tully and all the history that I had. And, you know, a lot of people had opinions of what was going to go on in that match. And that's awesome to speculate on it. But I think he gave a hell of an accounting of himself. And he gave you just a taste of what made him so special. And uh, that match was awesome. You know, kudos to the other team. You know, the, the Lucha guys. And uh, – they make a great three man team as well. And it just was so entertaining, man. I loved it. Yeah. Jurassic express put up a good fight, but man, I got to tell you, you know, I, I was lucky enough to be at that show. And once our quote unquote segment was done, I told Eric, I said, Hey, I know we're, we're just going to head back to the Airbnb, but if it's all right with you, 
why don't we go ask Sam if we can just sit in the crowd here in one of these seats and, and watch Tully's match. He said, Oh, of course, let's go. So I got to watch it in the crowd and dude, I was like an eighth grade girl. So happy to see Tully Blanchard hit that damn slingshot suplex. Uh, you know, nostalgia in wrestling is real. And there's a lot of things in wrestling that are just funny. Ha ha. And they're there to entertain us, but man, that meant something that was real. And the promo that Dax cut afterwards, I mean, Eric and I just looked at each other as he was doing it. We were like, God, we're witnessing, witnessing something. But of all the fun things I've gotten to do in wrestling, one of the coolest was when Tully came to the back, you know, every, every rigger, every staff member, every office guy, every performer, every talent, uh, every runner, every producer, every agent, they gave him a standing ovation and not like a polite one until he acknowledged it all the way through. I've never been backstage when something like that happened before. And I think AEW documented it. And I hope that footage comes out because it was a moment and man, as stoic as Tully can be at times, you couldn't wipe the grin off his face. If you tried, it was a moment. And I was really overcome with respect and admiration for the respect that the other performers and folks around the business had for somebody who was an all-time great and who maybe due to the luck of the draw and some bad hands, he was dealt probably didn't get the, re- the proper send off he deserved, but he did that night. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Well, his career was cut short probably by 10 years, right? You know, circumstances and you're right. That's the reason I love that company, man. Everybody pulls for each other. Everybody, you know, helps each other. It's one of those things to where we just want to give the fans and, you know, the best product possible and everyone can have an opinion. And, you know, when you got that many people giving you a stand to know, that's a pretty much a cross the board opinion because they wouldn't have done it unless they felt it. And, uh, kudos to the, the class acts backstage and everybody that works for that company. It was a really cool day, especially when consider the timing you know, where Tully's making his, you know, sort of last hurrah and JJ's on TV and there you are throwing up the four fingers and you've got all the old Crockett belts on TV. That just happened to be the day that Jim Crockett Jr. Passed away. And, uh, I know, you know, he's been a topic of conversation lately because we were lucky enough to score a conversation with him that spanned five hours and is now over at adfreeshows.com. But man, we haven't talked about it uh, at all since it happened it's almost like out of a movie that of all the nights that Tully would come back and all that would happen. It was the day that Mr. Crockett passed. It was almost like it was meant to be. It was divine intervention, if you will. Well, I'm so sorry for the Crockett family. I mean, despite, you know, the few issues that, that I had with Jimmy, he was one of the guys that, uh, that hired me, put some faith in me, allowed me to become, who I am because that's when really Arn Anderson was born and, and was able to flourish and gave me a foundation that I would take with me for the, for the rest of my career to this day. Uh, very sorry that of his passing. Um, and it was ironic that it happened, but it's almost like, uh, like you said, it's almost like there was divine intervention because there yeah. was so many things to, to digest there. But, you know, I think, you know, we all have a, a, a shelf life, you know, I guess that was Mr. Crockett's and it, it just added to a day in some weird way that was so positive for Tully and, and our company. It was almost like a old school, uh, giving a rub to the new school for lack of yep. a better term. Really remarkable. You know, me and you haven't talked about this off air at all. So I'm putting you on the spot a little bit. Have you had a chance to check out our interview with Mr. Crockett over on adfreeshows.com yet? I've got, I saw the first, the first one. I think you'll enjoy part two. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing to think about his story and how impactful, you know, he was, I mean, so many great things happened on his watch. You know, everybody talks about WrestleMania, but before there was a WrestleMania, there was a Starcade. And, you know, Dusty Rhodes became a megastar and Ric Flair and, of course, the Horseman and so many great things. And uh, I'm just glad that we got to pay tribute to him. And I'm really proud of it. I think it's the most historically significant thing we've done. And uh, speaking of historical topics, we're talking about one today. That's our topic today, the very last Nitro. It feels like the end of an era. 
And, you know, for, for other, I guess all intents and purposes, really, it really was. And people thought when this company went down, there'd never be another like it. And of course, TNA did their best to you know, try to get something going. And so did ring of honor, but I don't think it was until AEW came around that people felt like there was a real alternative. But when, when I told you we were going to be talking about the last nitro and it's hard to even imagine that we're right upon now later this week will be the 20 year anniversary on some level that feels about right. And on another level, it feels like it, what was that? Like 10 years ago, but 20 years, Does that feel right to you that WCW has been gone 20 years. It doesn't feel like it to me. No. And, and you know, for me, I've had decades disappear. You know, I'm thinking back to the, to the Crockett years and that seemed like not so long ago, but yes, a long time ago, the WCW years, I was with those guys 12 years. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a career. Yeah. You know, and, uh, it just feels like there were so many things going on during that period. And I was wearing so many hats as a, as a talent and helping out is writing the shows and, and helping out running the shows. When you wear that many hats, you don't necessarily hear about every, you know, backstage thing that goes down or every negotiation or conversation or, you know, so a lot of the stuff just, just passed me by because I had so many hats and going back and reliving it from the people telling the stories, you know, Eric has his stories and Tony has his stories and JR has his stories. I'm going, God, I don't remember that. I don't remember that. I don't remember that. It's because I wasn't included on that. Right. But it's man, there were so many things going on. And and that was a day more about what matches, you know, the matches actually, didn't matter as much as the emotion that was filling the backstage area. So let's, I guess, start at the beginning. When did you first realize, Hey man, WCW might not be headed in the right direction. I think Eric Bischoff was quoted as saying towards the end of 98 around August, it started to become very apparent to me that time Warner's conglomerate didn't really want WCW to survive. Does that timetable check out for you? Like maybe late summer 98 is when you realized Houston, we may have a problem. Yeah. I mean, you know, when a lot of the top guys were in the arguments that they were having with, you know, the bookers at the time and they were getting sent home and stuff. And I'm going, man, you cannot, you know, I understand that there's negotiations that have to go on and, and, you know, everybody needs to pull together here, but you can't take all your name players and send them home and act like, act like you're punishing them. That's not a punishment. The only one that's punish, punishing is the company. That's right. Um, you know, for those guys who are making strong money to be sent home and still get paid, it was, right. you know, it, it was just, and when you see their value is when those quarter hours start dropping. And right. those numbers start dropping and you realize what those guys are worth. That's when I saw that that was going to be okay with everybody. And like the, the front office people with Turner weren't going to say, Hey, I want this guy or this guy or this guy on TV. Why aren't these guys on TV? What happened? I'm not sure they were even abreast of what was going on during that period. Talk to me a little bit about when Bischoff leaves. I think it happens in the fall of 99, maybe. Uh, early September, 99, he comes back in the spring of 2000. Uh, and then of course, in between time, WCW would, would find Vince Russo Bischoff, obviously. And again, we're not talking about 2021 Bischoff. We're saying 1999 Bischoff, even he has acknowledged, boy, I could be a real prick to deal with at times. Did you feel like when Bischoff left? Okay. Now that he's out of the way now, maybe they will be, we'll be able to turn over a new leaf. Or did you still remember sort of the glory days of, gosh, a year or two prior where it felt like WCW could do no wrong? Are you excited, depressed, motivated, anxious? What was your feeling when Bischoff leaves and WCW sort of looking for a new head honcho, if you will? Well, you know, I, I worked for those guys 12 years, and that's that's a career. Yeah. Um, you know, I looked at when Eric came back, okay, you know, the front office is going to rally one more time and see if we can get this thing turned back around. Because when you look at success, when Eric was the boss, that's when we had the most success. Yeah. So 
in my immature mind, apparently, I thought, okay, we're going to get everybody back on, you know, that's under contract. We're going to get this thing, you know, start from scratch if we had to and rebuild this company because it had been torn down so badly, you know, it needed rebuilding almost from square one. And I thought, you know, in my mind that that's what was going to happen. But I doubt very seriously if Eric had anywhere near the stroke or the power that he had had at once time at one time. Obviously, the second go around. So, what deals he was able to make, I don't, I'm not sure of. You know how much control he had, I'm not sure of. But it was one of those things that I just I knew if you put the wrong guy in that seat, we were very close. We were sputtering, big time. Yep. We were very close to just flatlining. Well, so, you know, we try the Russo thing. We'll talk about that in long form some other time. But when you get the word that, hey, now Bischoff's coming back, is that a little motivating to you? I guess what I'm trying to drive at is we know the plan ultimately is Bischoff was going to put together an investor group to, to buy WCW and lead this company into the future. We know that didn't happen, uh, but all in all, were you in favor of that? Did you think Bischoff could pull the nose up on this thing if given sort of free reign? Well, it was kind of a catch-22 for me. Um, I didn't know if, if he did get these investors together. Um, and he was able to get, you know, the company bought. Was I even going to be a part of it? I see. You know, I was seriously thinking, hey, it's one of those things that I've been through everything from the beginning to the end and the collapse. And there's, you know, there's a saying in this business, you know, when, when the booker or the boss or the owner, you know, is ready to make changes. Hey, thank you. You know, your tremendous hand, but you, you've been here too long. We need to get, get some fresh meat in there. That's probably what I was looking at, to be honest with you. Uh, if, it, if WCW survived with Eric and the new investors, I wanted that to happen, but I just wasn't sure. I was going to be a part of it. Did you think maybe some of your, um, I don't know, your odds were diminished of, of a future employment based on your relationship at the time with Rick or because obviously he had a sort of, uh, tumultuous relationship. So shall, shall we say with Eric at times, did you think that perhaps hindered your chances or did you just think maybe your chances were diminished because you were no longer an in-ring performer and you're sort of more of a backstage agent or producer or whatever the title was at the time. Yeah. And that job, you know, I was replaceable. I'm sure. in a lot of people's minds, they thought anybody could do that. You know, anybody that had knowledge of the business that was, you know, at some point had drawn money and had a level head and could separate themselves from being one of the boys and all the things that go into being an agent. Um, I'm sure they thought there was a dozen guys out there that could do my job. So, you know, it, it, it definitely, when you can no longer wrestle, it cuts down on your ability to negotiate. That's for sure. So when Bischoff comes back, he realizes, Hey, WCW is not going to survive this merger. And he pitches Brad Siegel on selling the thing. We haven't talked about him before. Did you ever have a conversation with Siegel? Did you have a read on him or what his taste for wrestling or the wrestling business was? Had no, had no conversations with him. He was, again, he was kind of a faceless boss that lived in the, up the CNN tower. And that's where he operated out of, but it's like, you didn't have a face to go with it. And, you know, in those days, the only conversations that went down would be, like Eric and those guys, it wasn't like, you know, Kevin Sullivan when he was booking or Terry Taylor, when he was helping or whoever the guys were that were trying to book the show, it wasn't like they had an ongoing relationship with all the bosses from year one to year 12. Talk to me a little bit about just your gut. When you hear that, Hey, Bischoff's investors are the guys who essentially founded the classic sports network. And then of course ESPN is going to buy it for, I don't know, two years later, 175 million bucks or something like that. And it becomes ESPN classic, but they're playing the old nostalgia stuff. And that was really their bread and butter. Since you know that these guys really sell value in the, the classic sports realm. 
Did you think that might be a good thing for the direction the business was headed? Because it did feel like WCW was trying a lot of outside of the box stuff. You know, we're dropping blood from the ceiling. We're having human torch matches. We're burying Ric Flair in the desert. You know, he's in an insane asylum one week. There's lots of weird or interesting or outside of the box stuff that had happened in WCW. Did you think that might be a good thing or did you have a feeling at all? And it was just more about, Hey man, let's just hope we can keep this thing on life support and keep the paydays rolling in. Well, let me put it to you this way. And I'll tell you how out of the loop, all the rest of the, just like the soldiers were. All we heard was Eric is heading up some investors Hmm. and I never heard who they were what they represented. It was never explained to me, who are these investors? You know, so it was just an anonymous group of investors. But I knew if we went out of business, uh, having only one company, one major company is not good. No competition is not good. Competition is good for everybody. It keeps everybody sharp. So WCW even in the beginning when they weren't running house shows and they were just doing TVs and they weren't making a lot of money year to year, still it made the other company watch kind of pay attention, even though in those early days, Vince wasn't threatened, but he would watch and it would keep each company. We would play off of something they would do. They would play off of something we would do and it just keeps you sharp. Right. Let's talk about the year 2000. Um, allegedly WCW lost around $60 million. Now the accounting of that has been debated a lot by both Eric Bischoff and Guy Evans, who wrote a phenomenal book, the nitro book. I highly recommend it. I think it's the best book that's ever been written on WCW because they didn't just talk to sort of the quote unquote boys. They didn't just talk to WCW personnel. They talked to Turner folks. And they talked about how, you know, these days the WWE collects the majority of their money from licensing fees. So they're paid in order to produce a television product. Well, since this was a television company, there were no rights fees for WCW. And in fact, they came out of their own pocket to produce the show. So that counted against their P and L if you will, but there was no sort of rights fee that was allocated to them for the content they were getting. In addition to that, Allegedly, the pay-per-view revenue that came in didn't go in WCW's books. It went on Turner Home Entertainment. So when people hear, well, they lost $60 million, a lot of people say, oh, what a failure WCW must have been. But they're not really comparing apples to apples with the way accounting happened in other wrestling organizations because this was not a typical wrestling organization. This was a division of a television company. But I'm curious from the inside, I mean, obviously benefit of hindsight is, is 2020, but from the inside, had you heard that WCW was losing this kind of money? I mean, more than a million dollars a week. That's pretty remarkable. I don't even know how that happens. Right now. I'm not a, I'm not, like I said, I never was a guy that got involved with the books or the gross or the net or any of that stuff. I was more of a guy that was worried about, Hey, how was the rating this week? How were the quarter hours? What, you know, what was up, what was down and all that to lose that kind of money. Now, again, the books were different. This was my understanding when Turner bought the company, how they were not concerned about running house shows and all that. Since they bought the company, Turner owned the wrestling company he was going to be putting that programming from his own company on his station. So he was paying himself. Is that close to being right? Yeah. As far as I know. And that's where the money came to pay the contracts. He was pretty much paying himself. So there at the end to lose $60 million, I don't even know. How do you do that? Was an explanation of how it was lost or where it went? No, I mean, listen, it's all speculation at this point because those those books have not been opened up. But I think the Nitro book did a good job sort of examining it. Uh, I do want to mention that WCW was doing a 2.4 rating in the last quarter of 2000 for Nitro. And there at the very end, they're doing like a 2.1. And a lot of people would point to the creative and point out how woefully awful it was. 
And there's been lots of funny things that were mentioned as potential ideas. I think one of the more famous ones is someone pitched a, uh, an evil architect character. They wanted to name bill ding. Do you remember hearing any particularly bad creative like that and thinking, what the fuck are we doing? No, no, it's just, and this is just me. I'm not going to point fingers on anybody. I think it was a collective loss for everybody that worked for the company. But uh, some of the things were so outrageous, like you mentioned earlier. The, the reason we were able with Jim Crockett Promotions and somewhat to a degree with WCW, but the reason D- Jim Crockett Promotions was able to participate and compete with WWF at the time is because they brought characters, they brought children's lunch boxes, bigger than life characters. We brought blood and guts and quality wrestling matches. Yep. And that's what was sold to WCW. That's the company they inherited was a wrestling company. Uh, because there were failed efforts to try to introduce cartoon characters and bring yep. them in. It, that did not work. I, I would say collectively it didn't work. Would you say? Yeah, I agree. Clearly, I, I can't think of one that rose from debuting as this over the top character that, that went to a top guy. None of them. So, you know, and it might be said that maybe the company was doing what Vince did and saw the success that he had, but they didn't really know how to do that. Right. And when wrestling became second fiddle in importance to the top brass, we got to have characters. We got to have characters. We got to have bright colors. We got to have flashy entrances. We got to do all these off the wall things. The farther you got away from wrestling, the more fans you lost, in my opinion, because that was your two choices. You could get it on the other channel with the other company. You could get your feel of it. We brought something else and why you would get away from the thing that, you know, it's the old, you'll recognize this dance with the one that brung you. Oh, sure. Bear Bryant, I guess. Right. Yes. One of the ones that said that stick with what works. And you know, when you have talented performers, you don't have to dress them up like a cockatoo to get somebody's, you know, attention. You talked about how, you know, Vince McMahon was focused on kids, lunch boxes, and you guys were focused on blood guts back when it was Jim Crockett promotions that all changed with WCW. Do you remember there being a moment where you went, okay, we've lost our way. Well, you know, when you started having RoboCop, yeah. Come down and, and running your top heels off and all of these things that were so far fetched, you know, trying to make someone believe that the giant got chunked off the roof of a building and came back with seaweed all over him. Is it a joke? Yeah. If it's an inside joke and it's just for the talent in the locker rooms, one thing, but when you're putting that out there for the general public to absorb, that's things that they remember, you know, the blood from the ceiling and, you know, engulfing a guy and all, all those things that were just so far out. Um, people remember that and they remember it in a bad way. And it was right. telling me that the company was going a different direction. Uh, you know, there was one time, you know, when, and a lot of these guys were good talents, but when the glacier and, you know, all of those characters, Johnny B. Bad and, you know, PN News and all of those guys, Windbreaker Chip and Todd Checker. There was about eight or nine guys that were debuted pretty quickly all together, right. right? Yeah. That's, you know, you can only get over a couple things at a time on a TV show. You can't introduce that many characters, you know, and just have segment after segment after segment of guys that you don't know who they are or what they're about. Um, and I think that was a mistake. There was too many guys, you know, that were introduced at one time and you just, you know, you didn't have the, the luxury of getting those guys over 
on one TV show or two TV shows or three TV right. shows. That's when I kind of saw that, hey, it, you know, that's what the front office wants. That's what we're going to give them. And uh, then it reverted back to the guys. I mean, like the renegade, God bless him. It reverted back to the blood and guts guys to get them over. Because you put two of them together, you were going to be in trouble. Let me just say, it tickles me that I guess you called, you've told us that you called him this a lot as a rib. You just called firebreaker trip chip windbreaker chip again. <laughs> because it drives him nuts. Uh, it just tickles me so much. Uh, let, let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about January 11th, 2001 Bischoff and Brad Siegel hosted a 45 minute conference call to announce that they had a deal in place to take over WCW and Siegel on that call would say that Turner never planned to sell, but the offers were pouring in, including one from the WWF. Uh, this is also the very same day that the time Warner AOL merger finally goes down. Do you remember that call? Were you on that call? Oh no, of course not. That was way above my pay grade. Has you heard the rumor that amongst those offers was one from Jerry Jarrett that perhaps Jerry Jarrett wanted to take over WCW and he thought he could write the ship. Had you heard that? And if not, how do you think he would have done? No. Uh, you know, are we talking about coming in as the booker or buying the company, buying the company and being the guy, would he have had the resources to have bought the company? I think the, uh, the talk was he was going to try to raise the capital, perhaps get a bank loan and, and try to do his deal there. Um, I never really even heard that, that I remember now that could have been floating around. And it was one of those that, that I heard it deciphered it and figured, you know, for all of his success, I don't know that he's got the means to do that. Right. We're still talking about buying. I don't know what the company sold to WWF for. You remember that figure? Well, depending on who you believe it was two to $4 million, but no matter what number it was, there was guaranteed advertising in place that WWE was going to spend with Turner stations over the next five years. People conveniently leave that out and assume it was only $2 million. Uh, but it was more than that because they, they guaranteed advertising for future events and they used it to promote future WrestleMania. So that's one of those sort of fuzzy deals, but we'll go with $2 million for now. Uh, well, do I think Jerry Jarrett, probably, he probably had that kind of money. No problem. Yeah. Um, whether or not you could take that company and rebuild it, I think he would have probably just knowing the way people are. I'm a product of the way I was raised in the business and educated and all the things that, that I was surrounded by product of my environment. Sure. I think, I think, Jerry Jarrett would have tried to have revived the company in the Tennessee format. Right. Because that's what he knows. That's what he does. That's what he was successful at. I don't know that that would have been the way to go because in Tennessee, you got away with a lot of entertainment during the matches. There were such things as Tennessee high spots. Right. That, that was a real thing. And it was very entertaining, but, it was just one of those things that you had to suspend your disbelief for a minute to understand what, what you're seeing because it was ha ha spots comedy. Not that a lot of great talent didn't come through there. They did, but I would think Jerry would have in my mind at the time when somebody said, what do you think about Jerry Jarrett buying the company? Was it going to be another Tennessee territory? I don't know that that would have worked. Of course, we know that Bischoff's plan would have involved moving the company to either LA or Vegas and doing weekly tapings there at the same arena. His hope was to shut the company down and essentially quote unquote, go dark for a bit and then relaunch with a big bang pay-per-view and sort of say, Hey, here's our new direction. And they're in this in the middle of this due diligence process, just a couple days before greed, the last WCW pay-per-view that happened on March 18th, Jamie Kilner who's now the new CEO for Turner Broadcasting, announces they want to focus on comedy and sports and make the process of selling their programming a little more high-end. So there's no room for wrestling. So he effectively cancels Thunder and Nitro at the end of the month. So come April, there won't be any wrestling on Turner stations. And this all happens while Eric Bischoff and Brad Siegel are on vacation. And WCW even starts giving guys their 90-day notices. Do you remember hearing that 
first of all, had you ever met Jamie Kellner and did you hear his name for the first time? I guess when you find out he canceled our TV show. I never met the man, never heard about it. And, but when I did hear they were starting to cancel the TV shows and stuff, I did know that you had a lot of guys. Now the contracts in those days, a lot of them had 90 day rollovers that they, right. that they could terminate you at any time. Those that didn't were pretty much ironclad. And that was a lot of the top guys, you know, I was fortunate, Bill Bush, if you're out there, I love you. I appreciate you very much. During his period that he was in charge, I asked him just one thing. Bill, I'll stick with you to the end. Just take the rollovers out of my contract. And I had about, you know, I guess maybe maybe a year and a half to two years left. So when he took those wow. out, I knew I was covered. Because Good. at the end of 90 days, you know, they could terminate it. And I heard that was starting to happen. And I knew it was serious then because during all the times of making money and not making money from the beginning to the end, that's the one thing you could always count on. Every two weeks, your check was in the mail. It was there on time, no issues. And that was what appealed to me the very most, having that security for the family. Let's talk a little bit about that last pay-per-view greed. Uh, evidently things are bad here. Johnny Ace is uh, here, I guess, as a liaison for Eric Bischoff, trying to run the backstage area and the rumor and innuendo goes that Bagwell and Luger were so upset with the creative that they were supposed to lose to Sean O'Hare and Chuck Palumbo so quickly or Mark Jindrak rather, uh, that they actually walk out of the show. And depending on who you believe, some say, no, they just went to work out. Others say, no, they left. And even others say, okay, they went to work out, but we didn't think they were coming back based on how pissed off they were when they left. Do you remember that greed pay-per-view being a particular challenge for Bagwell and Luger? No, but I know that they always would come and check in, see what they were doing. They had enough leeway that they could leave and go work out. That was a regular thing, which as long as they were back, you know, an hour, hour and a half before showtime, I never looked at it as being an issue right. myself. You know, I never, when they left, I never thought they would have, they were too smart. Those guys aren't going to walk out on that kind of money. And that would be a breach. I would think of your contract. Let's talk a little bit about the Thursday before the last, <clears throat> it's March 22nd. And it was announced that WCW had purchased WCW. The Wall Street Journal even covered it on the 23rd of the month in their issue. And supposedly the executives and attorneys were working until the wee hours of the night, I guess into early Thursday morning to get a short form agreement in place. And the speculation at the time well, that was, is that it was 10 to 15 million. Of course, depending on who you believe, it was 2 to 4 million. But we would also hear that they're going to have a night of champions at the last WCW broadcast on Turner. And uh, it's written the penny pinching at this point is out of control. And Brad Siegel had insisted on personally approving travel and talent for the final show. They even supposedly locked down the office to make sure nothing was stolen. And there were reports of security checking briefcases and even frisking office staff as they left. Some folks were wised up to that and just went to the mail room and mailed shit to their house. Did you ever hear about <laughs> sort of the, uh, isn't that hilarious by the way? I mean, they'll find a workaround, right? Oh my God. So sad if, if true, but it's entertaining when you think about what once was and where it had diminished to talk to me a little bit about this night of the champion show. Um, I guess we, we, you know, we, we've talked for like 40 minutes now and we haven't addressed it. What was your official role or official title in WCW here in the last few days? Um, float around and, and just help organize the show, make sure guys were at gorilla at the proper time before their match went out. I really didn't have a specific assignment. It was 
such paranoia going on. I know I had a lot of people coming up to me, ask me what I thought. What did you think? What do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? Da, 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 da. Is this rumor true? Like suddenly now I'm in the know, you know, they don't need you till they need you uh, type situation. Um, I know there was a lot of speculation that if WWF did buy the company, they were going to clean house. Let's um, let's talk about, you know, your relationship with the office folks at that time. Did you have a relationship? Are you tight with anyone who was in the Atlanta office on a day-to-day basis? We know you're living in Charlotte and you're showing up for TV and you're traveling all over the country with the company, but did you have any great close personal friends in the, uh, in the towers there in Atlanta? Sullivan. Was he still there? Yeah. Probably Kevin. Um, Kevin was, you know, the one guy that I could pretty much get a, you know, what he believed to be the truth. You know, uh, I didn't figure he was going to stab me in the ass or, or any of those things. Uh, everyone was kind of on, uh, self-preservation mode, but I knew I could have a conversation with him and whatever knowledge he had, he could trust me with. So we, we were, uh, you know, we were just going to see what was going to go down and what was happening. Uh, I was, I was anxious a little bit, you know, when I found out that, uh, the representative from WWE, those representatives were, were coming to TV until I found out who it was. Well, let's talk about it. Uh, the final nitro happens and Shane McMahon shows up and holds a meeting. Tell us about that day. When you show up, what did you know? What didn't you know? What surprised you and what didn't surprise you before the show went live? Well, you know, not being an idiot all the time, you know, I have some, some moments of clarity that I understand exactly what's going on. And everything was speculation about who was going to buy the company. There was all kinds of rumors that you know, there was a last minute pitch coming from different investors and all this stuff. But when I saw Bruce, I think it was Bruce and Briscoe and Shane, right? Was Bruce with them? Yep. Bruce was there, Briscoe and Shane McMahon. When they walked in the door, it became crystal clear to me. Um, I knew that when I wrestled for Vince that I left, I mean, working a 90 day notice is about as, as good as you can possibly do in those days Right. when, when you leave a notice, because it, you know, that's a lot of time. If they chose to, they could beat you every week on TV and you walked out the door useless to the rest of the world. You know, there were ways if they wanted to do it, but, uh, I had left the right way. I knew that there was a time when, uh, I was going through the Charlotte airport and I don't remember exactly what year or anything like that, but I passed Vince for some reason who was flying a commercial and Shane and we were, I was walking through the airport. I got smacked in the back and I looked around and it was Shane and Vince and they went, Hey, how's everything going? Where are you heading? Da, 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 da. Well, Hey, you know, happy for your success. Da, 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 da. You look great. It's good to see you. And it was one of those situations that I'm sure they could have just kept walking. You know, and I'd have never seen them. So I had that conversation in my belt. And I had also had a very good relationship with, uh, which I thought, with with Bruce and with uh, Shane. Matter of fact, when Shane was learning all the aspects of the business per his dad, uh, he actually refereed a match and a couple of matches and Tully and I had those matches and I am sure it was because his dad knew that we would take care of him, not bury him, do all the right things and teach him something that was kind of in my tool belt too. And when we got there and saw all those guys, Shane walked right up to me, smiling big, shook his hand, 
Good to see you. Da 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 da. See you soon. And look me right in the eye. That kind of gave me confirmation that I was going to survive this in some capacity, which made me feel much better about the day I could relax. That's all he said. You um, allegedly, Vince McMahon is holding a meeting at the WWF to just tell the crew what's happening and that it's not going to affect their jobs. In WCW, you've sort of told us how you felt. What was the feeling like with all the other guys? Do you remember anybody being particularly negative or positive or hopeful or, you know, you know, I mean, just take us through sort of what you remember about the other guys. Well, everybody had a different, you know, opinion. Uh, and again, a lot of guys that were on contract for that company, top guys weren't there because they had been sent home. You know, if you think about that, now there were some left and there were, you know, everybody was having an opinion and they were asking you some guys, you know, that hadn't been in the business very long, were not very confident they were going to be absorbed. There were guys that were veterans that were not confident that they were going to be absorbed with the new company. It was, it was more a lot of doubt and, you know, people assessing their self-worth. Uh, I didn't see anybody that was walking around bowed up and cocky that they were just sure they were going to, you know, be taken aboard and pushed to the top or any of those. You could usually spot those guys that are a little bit overzealous in their thinking. I don't remember that. I just remember there was a lot of sidebars, a lot of private conversations and, and, uh, it just had this really weird aura because I don't think everybody really believed that was going to be the last show right? until those guys walked in and then it became very real. Were you, uh, what was your role that night? Do you remember, I mean, were there matches you put together or talent you worked with or anything like that? Can you tell us any specifics of what all you were working with? You want to know the truth? I have no memory of what I did. I could have put together three matches or I could have done none and just been a guy that was doing odds and ends. I, I don't really remember because it was, for me, I was smart enough to know this is it. And it was, it was emotional. Did you feel like, you know, I mean, listen, most of us listening to this have uh, worked with folks for a long time and then through a, series of different events, what have you, those days come to an end. Maybe you take a promotion and, or you move or someone that you work closely with takes a promotion or they move, or maybe even unfortunately they pass away, but it's just one of those weird deals where you're probably not really prepared for it. And it almost feels like a second family. And then it's not, was that the same way when WCW went down? Like these are the guys that you saw every single week and now, sometimes, you know, those unfortunate circumstances catch us by surprise. This is one where, you know, going in, man, this is probably it. I'm not going to see any of these guys again. Do you try to collect some name and numbers? Do you try to go out with the guys after and have a beer? Or is it more like, Hey man, catch you down the road. And that's it. Um, well, I knew that I wouldn't be seeing, you know, people like, you know, Jandy Engel and, and the backstage people and, you know, Keith Mitchell and all the guys in production that were, that were friends of mine. Some of them I worked with 12 years and, and couldn't tell you their name today. And they probably couldn't tell you mine. I don't know, but I would pass them backstage and they'd be taping down wires or, or doing whatever their job was, you know, and just familiar faces in 12 years, you know, you establish relationships, I don't think they're friendships. It's not people that when I went home on my off day, off day, I would call them or they would call me, but they were good working relationships. And, uh, you know, Atlanta being close to Rome where I grew up, it always had that. Anytime I went to Atlanta, it was almost like going home until Charlotte became my home in 85 and all that changed. It's like I was a, a deep, uh, just a recent memory 
uh, of ever living in Rome. But anyway, getting back to that, to that setting, you know, it was going to be, I kind of had an idea of what guys, you know, were going to be taken. But then again, I thought, well, Hey, listen, what if he buys the company and he takes eight top guys and, uh, and everybody else let, you know, they let go. What, what is out there? What is still available? Japan was out there. I think there was independence, you know, you know, Tennessee was probably still running a little bit, but not an option to make the kind of money that we were all used to making. Let's, um, let's talk about the show that night. Uh, we had, you know, some really good, I don't know, feel good moments, I guess. We got Rey Mysterio and Billy Kidman beating Shannon Moore and Evan Courageous. They also beat Kaz and Hayashi and Yang. They don't get a ton of time. It's three minutes and 38 seconds, but it's a nice feel good moment for Rey Mysterio, who's really been a big part of the show for a long, long time. Then we get Shane Helms beating uh, Chavo Guerrero Jr. We get to show off that vertebraker. Uh, Shane retains the WCW Cruiserweight Championship. They only get four minutes, 39 seconds. we got Sean O'Hare teaming with Chuck Palumbo to beat Lance Storm and Mike Awesome. they got three minutes and 21 seconds. Uh, as you might imagine, the Swanton Bomb from Sean O'Hare, which was a hot move at the time. We get Sean Stasiak beating Bam Bam Bigelow, one of Bam Bam Bigelow's last primetime matches. Uh, it's a little silly, but it happens. The pre-match stipulation is if Bigelow wins, uh, then Sean has to get a tattoo. Then we see Ray and Billy defeat Elix Skipper and Kid Romeo, and they win the WCW Cruiserweight Tag Team Championship. That match, or that title, was actually just debuted at the last pay-per-view, so it's unfortunate that uh, you know we didn't get to see more of that. The belt sucked, but the idea <laughs> of focusing more on this talent was really, really good. But then we see something that's sort of a feel-good moment, man. We see Sting and Ric Flair wrestle. They wrestled on the very first Nitro. And of course, on the very first clash of the champions, and it felt like for a long time, if a Turner station needed to pop a rating, I know what to do. Let's just put sting in there with Ric Flair. And they did it here. And allegedly Flair wasn't even ready to wrestle that night. He actually wound up wrestling in a t-shirt, which is very unflair like, but man, having sting and Flair wrestle on the last nitro, that's about as WCW as it gets, right? Yeah, I think that was an excellent call. And it was, you know, Sting was the guy that never left. He was the most loyal employee they ever had. You know, I think Rick was one of the faces, certainly, of, of wrestling, period, worldwide, much less WCW. And uh, I think, to, you know, to have that match was, was a very, very good call. And I know those guys really enjoyed it. And they it wasn't lost on them that, this being the last time, you know, they might ever work together. Who knows? Um, so you could tell it was emotional. You know, a lot of guys watching that match that understood what it was. It was the end of an arrows, the end of a company that, you know, had been around for a long time. And, uh, you know, people that knew the business were not happy that it was happening. And it was, there was this sad cloud kind of floating over everything. But it didn't affect the talent, just like the cruiserweights. They went out and they used it as a, as a vehicle to, hey, if this is going to be my last match, I'm going to tear the joint down. And that's what I always respected about all the cruiserweights, man. They would go out and tear it up. Speaking of tearing it up, we got the world title on the line. Booker T is going to challenge Scott Steiner. Scott comes in as your world champion. Booker T is your U.S. champion. So it's title versus title. Essentially Booker T beat Scott Steiner here, who has Medeja in tow. Now they only get five minutes and 11 seconds, but still a bookend gets it done. And now Booker T is going to close down WCW as both the world champion and the United States champion. You know, I just recently talked about Booker T uh, on some of my other podcasts and I think Aaron, for whatever reason, and maybe it's because WCW wasn't exactly at the top of the mountain when his run on top happened. He's probably one of the unsung heroes of WCW. Uh, in my research, I found he was the most decorated wrestler in WCW history. He had more title reigns when you combine the tag belt and the TV title and the U S title and the world title. And he had gold more than anybody. And then of course we know when he actually makes his way into the WWF, he has a better run than most everybody who came over from WCW. 
And I think it's sort of fitting that on the last Nitro here, he's the guy who uh, gets the nod, becomes the world champion for the last time that there's a real WCW show. Think the world of book. Uh, you know, I loved him and Stevie and Sensational Sherry when they were together. Awesome, awesome tandem. But you could always tell Booker was going to be at some point separated out as a single. He just, I mean, when you say enter, the, the guy's entertaining, I can th- look at that and go, okay, what guy are we talking about? Okay, is he doing all ha ha? That's considered one form of entertaining. Or is the guy going out and athletically just tearing the joint down, but mixing some of the razzmatazz like the spinaroni and all that stuff in with quality work? And that's what Booker was. He was a guy that would go out. He would make you believe that, that he was never going to stay down. He made you believe on in him as the character. He made you believe he could fight. But when it was time, he entertained and he would hit that spin rooney and, and all kind of different things that he had. And uh, he was the all-around cowboy. And I was so happy that he was finally getting his – claim to fame. And once he got to the WWF, you know, surprisingly, uh, they must have seen it in him too, because they just continued on. And, you know, he's the only King of the ring that I thought did that tired gimmick justice. I yep. just not a fan of that. I think it was just ha ha. And it just made most guys just look foolish, you know, but he's a, he's a guy that took it and ran with it and made it entertaining and uh, had a hell of a run with the company as a result. Let's bounce around a little bit and talk about that night. Uh, this show happens in Panama city. It's an outdoor show. Did you enjoy these outdoor beach shows that WCW would put on? Oh, I loved them. I loved them. Uh, it was just different, man. It was outdoors and you had those spring breakers, raising hell it was just a great environment you know we would always come in that's one of the times that we would fly in i would early the day before and you could get a beach day you know the day before the show on sunday before the monday nitro and uh man it was great i love that whole that's it as you know conrad i've been we both been down there a million times pensacola to panama city is the most beautiful beach in the world not in the country, in the world. And it's just it's just a great atmosphere. The water is blue-green and clear, and the sand is white like sugar and thick. It's, it's beautiful. Get all those kids down there, raise them hell. It's a great environment. Let's bounce around a little bit and talk about some, some rumor and innuendo. Allegedly, Shane Douglas no-showed the show that made all the newsletters at the time. Did you ever hear that, that Shane no-showed? Mm. It wouldn't have been a big issue. I don't think that day in lieu of everything else going on, it wouldn't have been a hot topic. Right. It would, I, I, the normal guys like me, the lay person would just, you know, thought he wasn't booked. Supposedly Tori Wilson, Bob Ryder, Jeff Jarrett, B. Brian Blair, road dog and Dory funk were all backstage. Of course we know road dog didn't live too far from there. Uh, Bob Ryder, a former WCW staple, may he rest in peace. Of course, Tori Wilson, the same. Uh, but Jeff Jarrett, his name sticks out to me because on this same episode of Monday Night Raw that ran the same night, not only are they going to simulcast the segment of Vince McMahon and do the whole Shane McMahon angle, but they also get a commercial for WrestleMania 17, which was the biggest WrestleMania of all time at that point. And this is the go home raw. So we're six days away from the biggest wrestling show of the year. Why not run a commercial on the two biggest wrestling shows around, but on that show, Vince McMahon publicly fires Jeff Jarrett. And you know, Jeff at the time was spelling his name, J E double F J A double R, you know, the routine and Vince says F I double R E D or whatever you're fired as his famous, you're fired gimmick. And supposedly Bruce says that. He was watching on a monitor backstage at Nitro. So he's not at Raw. He's down with you guys at Nitro. And Jeff Jarrett's over his shoulder, sees the bit, laughs, pats Bruce on the back, and takes a walk. 
did you feel bad for Jeff knowing, well, given the fact that allegedly he held up Vince McMahon for money to drop the title to China, it's probably all she wrote for Jeff in wrestling, right? Yeah. I mean, I'd always heard, you know, they held him up for how much money? Hundreds of thousands of dollars, allegedly. Um, I just, I'm not sure that I believe that. And I, I have to say, if you did successfully hold the guy up and the guy paid it, I would imagine there would be some all hell fixing to rain down pretty quickly. But I would think it would have been immediate. Right. I don't think I would have, you know, knowing Vince, he would have put the guy on TV after that. It doesn't get any bigger than that, I guess is my point. No, he didn't like, you know, his contract had expired just to refresh your memory on the story. He, his contract expired while he was still intercontinental champion and Jr. thought, well, we've got a deal in place verbally. We'll be fine. They get to the day of the pay-per-view and it's a good housekeeping match where China is going to beat him where she's going to hit him with an ironing board and baking powder or whatever. Uh, and she'll become the intercontinental champion. But when Jeff shows up, he realizes I don't have a contract. So what do y'all want to do? And of course they want him to lose and he wants his money up front. And I think to hear Jeff tell it wasn't holding Vince up for money and holding him hostage. I just knew that I was owed for my royalties and my pay-per-views and all that. And I didn't have confidence that when I jump ship tomorrow and show up on nitro that I'm going to get paid fairly. So I just want what's due and what's coming to me. Allegedly. Uh, but he didn't just want to check. He supposedly wanted to complicate it and asked for cash, which on a Sunday, as you can imagine, it's kind of hard to get banks aren't open. It's not like the, the box office probably has a couple hundred grand up there, but somehow they find a way, make it happen. But I guess Vince never forgot. <laughs> and then the first chance he gets before the ink is really even dry on the contract, an old public execution. And, uh, I don't know, man, I kind of feel bad for Jeff knowing he's finding out he's fired at the same time. Everybody else is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I kind of feel bad for everybody. <laughs> yeah. No, no win in that situation. Let's talk about Johnny Ace for a minute. Uh, Johnny Ace has made the news again now here in 2021, because it's been revealed that he's back as a part of talent relations. Jim Ross speculated the other day. He doesn't think he ever really left, but now he's back full time. And I guess has uh, the big seat that he used to Jim Ross used to uh, sit in Johnny Ace is really sort of running that role here for WCW before he's done it anywhere else. How did Johnny Ace do in that role for WCW? And what do you think about the news that he's back doing that job for WWE in present day? Well, he had never done it before he got the job with WCW. Not never knowing who the boss was, I guess, was, you know, tough. Uh, I guess, you know, the only thing that he really had stroke over, I think, with WCW was just like, you know, the, the agents and, and who, you know, assigning matches and stuff like that. Uh, however, once he got to WWF, I guess he had been looked at as the booker for Japan. That was on his resume. Not knowing how long or, or exactly what he did for WCW in that role of probably lead agent was what it would have been called, not talent relations. But then he moved to, he got hired in, and I guess JR pretty much trained him, right? For, for for that job, who had it at the at the time? JR was head of talent relations, correct? Yeah, he was. I don't know what their relationship was like. I don't know that JR was necessarily thrilled at the idea of Johnny Ace coming in, but I don't guess I've ever really asked. You know, that would be a better question probably to ask that him because yeah, sure. you know, uh he just when Dean and myself and Fit and Johnny were hired, JR's the one that hired us. We went to Atlanta. He, they gave us a call after the last show was over. I'm not sure how long it was, a couple of weeks, few weeks, whatever. And they said, we'd like to meet with you in Atlanta. So I drove down there and 
Fit drove down and Dean drove down and Johnny was there and he was kind of orchestrating, you know, who went in to see JR and JR is the one that hired us. Right. And so, you know, we got a job. We, we talked a little bit of money um, and uh, what our situation would be. And uh, we signed a couple things that day and went back home. And it was a couple weeks before they brought us to TV. So uh, I guess Johnny having that role is what most people would look at. If you look back at his career with Japan and and with WCW, he had been in a supervisor capacity, which might have given him some experience to do the talent relations job. A couple more questions, then we'll wrap this one up. Allegedly, there's a, a meeting held by the WWF at the WCW offices, and normally they would happen in the tower, but supposedly this layoff meeting happens at the power plant. And Loretta Walker from Turner's uh, Home Resources Department handled it, not Brad Siegel. Were you a part of that, or did you hear about that, or was that not something you were involved in? No. No, that was – I would think that would be more about office personnel and people at the school, right, other than the the uh, contract talent. One last one. Allegedly, Shane McMahon showed up with security. I think Bruce debunked that, but I think – the rumor and innuendo was Shane wasn't sure how he would be received here and felt like he needed security. Uh, Bruce joked and said the only security he needed was Gerald Briscoe. Uh, do you remember if Shane showed up with any security that day? In I was, City? I, uh, I didn't see any security, just the three of them. Now, now Jim, who was, who is the, the head of security, you know, Jim Ballhead used to be yeah. a state, state trooper, but I think yep. he stays with Vince mostly. So I, I think it was just the three of them showed up. I didn't see any security. Well, let's put a bow on this episode. Anything else? Any final thoughts you want to throw out there about uh, the very last Nitro? It had to be, uh, I guess, maybe bittersweet is the right word. Yeah. I mean, you know, everything has to come to an end. It just, uh, it was a shame to see it start where it started being built into what it became only to diminish what it was at the very end and to be there for all of that, you know, it's like, wow, now what? And being a realist, I knew I had some time left on my contract. I'd gotten a call from them saying they were going to honor it. So I had, I had some time before I knew I was going to be hired with, with WWF. But there was that period of, of when I was home between the jobs and went, you know, uh, what do we do now? And uh, that, that not knowing in this business when you've only got a couple of options, I mean, if you're in your business, Conrad, or, or you're a waiter or a bartender or you sell cars, you get canned, you have other options. There really wasn't any other options if you didn't get picked up and you got canned on this deal. So I was trying to think realistically and think about, okay, what if we're back to that? What if thing? So that was where my head was at during that period. Well, we hope your head is in asking aren't anything. We'll be back next week with ask aren't anything. We do it every other week here on the show. I want to give you guys a heads up about what's coming in the next month, though, because believe it or not, WrestleMania is almost here. Uh, and as Arn and I are recording this, there's still a lot of questions unanswered about what this year's WrestleMania will be like. But on April 6th, we'll be back your way talking about WrestleMania 32, which is a pretty important WrestleMania and uh, often regarded as one of the more entertaining ones uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, so we're going to have fun talking about the good, the bad, the ugly about WrestleMania 32. Uh, two weeks after that, we'll be talking Payback 2016. Uh, two weeks after that, we're talking Over the Limit 2011. Two weeks after that, Extreme Rules 2016. So as we get through March and April, we're going to have some fun stuff coming your way, or April and May, rather. Uh, Art, man, I appreciate you taking the time to talk about old Nitro stuff here today. This is, uh, I guess, a sad day in history. Whenever we think about March 26, 2001, whenever I hear March 26, I always think about the last Nitro. 
Does that date stick out for you too, as much as it does for fans or does it all sort of run together after all these years? No, I just remember, I, I, I couldn't have told you what that date was of that show. I can just tell you what it meant to me. And, you know, uh, it was an ending and sometimes endings are happy endings and sometimes they're not. That was not a particular happy ending for me. It was a little bit sad. Uh, but you know what? Also believe that if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. And I have had a lot of water under the bridge since that fateful day employed full time from that day to this pretty much. And, uh, it is what it is. It is what it is. The train rolls on. Tell everybody, you know, about your new favorite wrestling podcast. It's Arn. Of course you get all these shows early and ad free over at adfreeshows.com. And you don't want to miss some very fun stuff. We've got planned coming your way. If you haven't already go sign up right now, you're going to love the fabulous interview part one and part two with Jim Crockett jr. We've got a fun round table with Eric, Tony and Jr. And, uh, some really fun WrestleMania stuff coming your way where you hear Jr. and Tony Schiavone do alternate commentary on some of your famous or your favorite rather WrestleMania matches that you've never heard from these guys before. It's all happening right now at adfreeshows.com. We haven't plugged it a lot, but we've got a new horseman jacket available as well over at boxagimmicks.com. And Arn, whenever people talk about these horseman jackets, it feels like mine and your Twitter absolutely blow up. People are pumped about this new jacket, are they not? Yeah, and they've never been available before. I've had people over the years, you know, whatever how do you, whatever happened to those horseman jackets, you know? It's, you know, you still got those horseman jackets. How can I get one of those? And they weren't available until now. And we never even thought about making them available until now. But, you know, it's, it, it is the symbol of excellence to this day. And uh, I'm just happy that people can enjoy them. You know, most guys wear jackets and sports jackets and all those things. But this one stands out. People see that logo on the back. They know exactly what you're talking about. So there's a lot of pride that goes in wearing them. I know with me and uh, hopefully the fans will enjoy getting a chance to get one. Go check it out. If you haven't already, it's box Of course, you can hear all these shows early and ad free over at adfreeshows.com. If you've got a question for next week's ask aren't anything, go ask it right now on Twitter at the orange show. I am at, Hey, Hey, it's Conrad and we are out of time. We'll see you next week right here on Arn. Hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.